Hello, world history students. This is Mrs. Politsky, and I have your notes for chapter 32, section 4, talking about nationalism in the developing world with emphasis on Latin America. And one of the things that I want to emphasize is that era of time that we're kind of looking at is kind of the time of the Cold War. And that has a lot of influence as far as what was happening here. And we're going to start with Cuba. Uh, the United States tried to keep communism um, from spreading by supporting anti-communist regimes or utilizing a policy known as containment. Uh, containment was this idea of trying to keep uh, communism in its place and not allowing it to spread. And, and this was a policy that we had uh, started using in parts of uh, Europe right after World War II to kind of keep the Soviet Union uh, out of Western Europe. And we also were using it in the Far East uh, when we talk about the Korean Wars and the Vietnam War. Um, containment was really kind of a, an, an issue kind of at the heart of both of those affairs. Well, not long after we get involved in those conflicts, uh, we start noticing that we have some issues with communism spreading into the Western Hemisphere. And Cuba just happens to be the place where this is all kind of starting. So in 1959, there was a, a long guerrilla struggle uh, in the nation of, of Cuba. And Fidel Castro, who you see pictured to the right, ousted a man named Fujinsa Batista. Uh, Batista had kind of been a, a dictator, I think is probably the best way to explain it. But he was anti-communist and hence he was getting some support from the United States. Uh, Castro being kind of beloved by the, the poor, uh, was able to um, to gather forces and to oust Batista. Um, and needless to say, uh, some people thought that that would be the end of it. But not long after Fidel takes power, uh, do we find out the true nature of his, uh, his mission here. Castro and one of his followers named Che Herrera, uh, they wanted a Marxist regime in Cuba. In other words, they, they wanted a government that followed the, the policy of Karl Marx, this idea that uh, the proletariat, meaning the, the people who were kind of without power, would uh, take control of the government and share all the resources. And the idea was to end U.S. dominance uh, within the nation, uh, to redistribute the wealth and to reform society. Okay, under Castro, Cuba was able to end some things. They, they did end illiteracy, meaning that they, they educated uh, the people of their nation. Uh, they were able to provide for free health care, and there was basically national property. In other words, because they were a communist country, uh, property was held collectively by the people. And not only was that, but the same goes with business. But there's some sacrifices. Uh, a lot of our Cubans lost their civil, civil liberties, meaning that they could not freely speak uh, about what they you know, felt about the government. Um, in some cases, some felt threatened by the government and were forced to, to flee as refugees. And some of the places that many of these refugees ended up were places like Florida. Uh, needless to say, the United States was not very pleased with Castro and his policies. Uh, matter of fact, he shortly after he came to power aligned himself with the Soviet Union and hence he became an enemy of the United States. So we tried to figure out ways that we could overthrow his government. And in 1961, shortly after uh, President Kennedy took office, uh, there was an event that was actually pre-planned, planned before Kennedy even took office, uh, that became known as a, a big failure, it was known as the Bay of Pigs invasion. Uh, the Bay of Pigs, if you take a look at the map, it's kind of on the, the southern part of uh, the nation of Cuba. But it is there where a group of Cuban exiles who had been trained by the CIA uh, stormed the beaches of Cuba uh, to kind of retake their government. Unfortunately, the support that they were supposed to receive from the United States uh, was kind of cut off. And some of this was done um, 
by the Kennedy administration in hopes of not provoking the Soviet Union and, and maybe starting a third world war. Needless to say, you had a lot of people that were uh, captured or killed in this battle. And needless to say, it did not help the image of President Kennedy in his first few uh, weeks in, pre in the presidency. So needless to say, he, he did uh, have to kind of swallow his pride and admit his failure there. But a year after the Bay of Pigs, there was another showdown. And this occurred between the United States and the Soviet Union over the placement of nuclear missiles in Cuba. Uh, the leader of the Soviet Union, a guy named Khrushchev, thought that after the Bay of Pigs, Kennedy was kind of weak. And he thought it would be the perfect opportunity to place um, basically um, intercontinental missiles uh, within, you know, kind of a, a short range distance of the United States with nuclear warheads. Now, just so you understand, the United States had placed similar missiles in parts of Turkey. And I guess you could say it's kind of like an eye for an eye. Um, so needless to say, we had been uh, kind of doing surveillance missions over Cuba, and we had spotted these, um, what looked like these missile sites that were being constructed. And this alerted our government, and, and we prepared ourselves for kind of a showdown. And what ends up happening is our Navy uh, sets up a blockade to stop the Soviet ships from delivering uh, the rest of the, the components for these missiles. And what happens for about two weeks is a, a situation that is known as uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis. And it's basically kind of the closest that the United States probably got to a third world war or an all out nuclear holocaust, if you want to call it that. Needless to say, the, the Soviets backed down. Uh, we removed some of our missiles from um, parts of Turkey and, and the Soviets obviously then set up their missile sites in Cuba. But it did open up talks between the Soviet Union and the United States. So, you know, even though it was a kind of a scary situation, it, it did bring about some um, discussions about the use of nuclear warheads and actually led to some talks that limited uh, the number of weapons that were being produced. Anyway, after the Soviet Union uh, was broken up in 1991, after the fall of communism in the, uh, basically in Europe, Cuba's economy was devastated by the loss of Soviet aid. Uh, there was also a poor sugar harvest. Uh, the fact that uh, the United States also had an embargo of Cuba, meaning that uh, we would not allow Cuban goods to be sold in the United States. Um, we wouldn't necessarily allow for any aid to be sent to Cuba, and that includes agricultural aid. Uh, so in a way, we were, we were really putting uh, pressure on Cuba to uh, to reform itself. Okay, uh, elsewhere in Central America, uh, some of the key economic trends in the post Latin America, post war Latin America, were land reform, uh, industrialization. Socially, there was a gap between the rich and the poor, and widespread poverty. In Central America, there were several revolutions during this Cold War era. Places like Guatemala, there was a civil war uh, between guerrilla fighters and the military, and some of the some of the um, battles that happened there go well on into the 1990s and early 2000s, and hence might have led to uh, people trying to flee Guatemala and come to the United States because uh, they, they didn't see it being safe there in their homeland. Salvador faced a civil war between communists uh, who um, supported guerrillas and the army that was supported by the United States. Uh, this civil war would start roughly around uh, the late 1970s, beginning of the 1980s, and last until almost the beginning of the 1990s, so roughly 10 years of fighting, and it was incredibly bloody. Uh, in Nicaragua, you had the Sandinistas, who had come to power, the Sandinistas, uh, for the most part, were a group that, again, were kind of Marxist. Uh, the Contras were a rebel group. Um, so needless to say, that uh, 
there were issues here and, and this is going to pull the United States in. There was a um, kind of a, an event in the 1980s known as the Iran-Contra affair where the United States tried to send military aid to the Contras uh, to help them oust the, the communists. And needless to say, there was some money laundering and, and there were people that um, obviously had to go to jail for some of those kind of wrongs. Anyway, uh, the belief that the Catholic Church should be active in the struggle for economics and political equality is known as liberation theology. And this was something that was really uh, taking root in parts of Central America and South America. Matter of fact, uh, if you read any um, biography information about Pope Francis, uh, you'll know that he has ties to this movement. Well, in the country of El Salvador, uh, probably the one of the more um, outspoken liberation theologians was a guy named uh, Archbishop Oscar Romero. And Romero had made enemies with the government. Uh, matter of fact, he had been labeled as a Marxist, which probably was not an accurate labeling. But needless to say, he was targeted and he was assassinated while, while he was um, uh, celebrating mass. And so he has been martyred. And matter of fact, he is now a saint in the Catholic Church, um, probably one of the more, um, I guess you could say, modern martyrs of Catholicism. 1977, the United States and Panama signed uh, what is known as the Panama Canal Treaties. Uh, these are treaties that would eventually lead to the U.S. handing back the Panama Canal Zone, which is a kind of a 10-mile swath of land that kind of borders the canal. And this was supposed to take place before 1999. Uh, matter of fact, you know, if in the end, um, the canal was handed back, I think, in 1997. But leading up to that, there was a little political instability in Panama, and there was the rise of a kind of a, a thug, a dictator, if you want to call him that, uh, named Manuel Noriega. Uh, in 1989, our president, George H.W. Bush, sent troops to Panama uh, to, for the most part, to uh, bring back Noriega to stand trial for drug trafficking charges. Uh, it was believed that um, Noriega had basically uh, allowed for drug trafficking to come into the United States. It was kind of basically, a, you know, kind of a thug, and he was making money off of this. Anyway, Noriega was eventually captured. He served roughly 17 years in the United States on drug trafficking charges, eventually would be sent home uh, after he had fallen ill, and eventually Noriega will pass away. Uh, but he was. Um, Definitely probably enemy number one for uh, President Bush uh, during that time frame. In South America, um, Argentina, uh, our Argentine leader Juan Perón, Perón uh, he happened to be kind of a, a dictator. Uh, him and his wife Eva Perón, um, who is sometimes known as Evita. Anyway, they they uh, ruled together. Uh, Perón was known for nationalizing many industries, and he supported the military and unions in order to stay in power. And nevertheless, uh, he was ousted in a military coup in 1955. Uh, years later, in 1982, the Argentine military sought to bolster their failing popularity by engaging in a war with Great Britain over what is known as the Falkland Islands. The Falkland Islands are kind of you know, some distance uh, off the, the southern tip of Argentina. Uh, these are islands that have been in basically the holdings of the British Empire for years. And uh, when the Argentine military uh, occupied this, uh, Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher didn't hesitate to send uh, her, her troops down there to reacquired the, this property. Matter of fact, Ronald Reagan had uh, suggested that Thatcher to just let the Argentines have this property back, but uh, she stood firm, even though there were many lives lost as a result of that, but uh, needless to say, she wasn't going to back down from this. Uh, she saw this as kind of her own Cold War struggle. In Chile, 
uh, Chilean socialist leader uh, Salvador Allende uh, sought to improve the standard of living by nationalizing American-owned businesses and distributing land to the poor. In 1973, he was ousted from power in a military coup led by General Augusto uh, Pinochet. And uh, unfortunately, he was, um, when we talk about Allende, uh, he was actually assassinated in this whole uh, situation. Anyway, uh, Pinochet, he was really kind of a ruthless guy. There were a lot of people uh, who, for the most part, felt like their their rights had been suspended. Um, civil liberties had been taken away. He, he really was kind of an authoritarian leader. But in 1989, uh, Pinochet uh, authorized elections. And I think he wasn't he wasn't really prepared for the outcome. He actually lost uh, because the elections were won by uh, uh, Patricio uh, Elwin, uh, who would go on to lead Chile for about four years. But he is kind of noted as the guy who who kind of brings uh, Chile back from kind of the dark side and, and kind of aligns them into a more centralist position and kind of stabilizes the nation. In Colombia, economic challenges created poverty. In turn, those living in poverty turned to the drug trade. And drug uh, cartels have forced the government to cooperate. Um, and then violent rebels made deals with the cartels to oppose the government, which uh, really kind of uh, kind of baffled uh, the government and, and really kind of bogged it down. Uh, for many years, the United States sent agents down there to kind of kind of help uh, stop some of this. And it's going to take many years to kind of get this under control. Thank you very much.